Thanks to all the amazing creative morning people, girls, <laughs> and to you all for coming here this early in the morning. I think that's one of the earliest talks I've ever given. And uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about my uh, works and my process. And the theme of this uh, creative morning uh, event, the yearly theme, is equality. So I want you to keep in mind while I'm uh, speaking in quality of information. So not all data was born equal, but today data is an enabler and uh, information in general. And I'm, I owe my career shift from tech to art to information. So, okay, before even that, uh, just a little bit about my background, I come from uh, computer science and biology. Uh, I did uh, uh, data science, uh, bioinformatics and machine learning. And I quit my day job at Microsoft at the time, about seven years ago, uh, to do full-time art. And that's what I do today. And that is following a electronics personal revolution. So I started playing with electronics to build some small projects and at some point they got a bit bigger and I had the opportunity to show them. And that's what made me actually made my career shift and this is one of the first projects I ever showed in an art event. So it was done with uh, two collaborators, Jonathan Rubin and Asaf Talmudi. And what we did, uh, we were approached by two architects, uh, Uri Riker and uh, Natania Zak, who built a green pavilion at the Batyam boardwalk at, uh, for the Biennale of Landscape Urbanism about uh, almost seven years ago. And the uh, architect project was a, a pavilion where green energy was produced from the sun and the wind. And they actually wanted to show the use of this green energy in a fun way that will enable people to be part of this uh, project. So we uh, built a big uh, robotic drumming circle, which you can see on the, the mountain on the poles, on the electricity poles. And I'll just show you how it looked like just when we put it in the studio. So what you see here is 18 Darbuka drums. Each one of the drums uh, had uh, two robotic drumsticks on them, and it was all controlled in real time from an iPad. So it means 36 channels of live drumming controlled in real time, enabling to uh, produce live beats, to play them. We could invite uh, musicians to play with us. And that's the way it works. So we created a very simple interface where every dot that I put on the interface creates one beat. It's a sequencer, it's a standard way of producing a beat. And you can see that each time I make the beat more and more complicated, I can save beats, I can have uh, some other parameters changed. And what it looks like at the end is this. That's the way it looks at the boardwalk. So we wanted a project that will make people come and talk, basically, and we'd get people together. And what we realized when we uh, had all these settings together is that people approach this uh, pavement, they start walking, and then at some point around the center of the project, they realize that it's not uh, recorded music. It's actually live music played around them, and that's the place where they stop. So there was kind of like a focus point that we didn't make uh, explicitly, but was created by the setting, where people actually stopped, and that, that's where the communication started. So this is uh, Asaf and Eyal Talmudi, who are playing the drums and the sax. I have a long history of uh, painting machines, and generally speaking, 
moving information from the digital domain to the physical domain. And this is, I think, my first painting machine that I built. It's a cellular graffiti uh, printer that takes information from a cellular phone, which is all the information, basically, and uh, prints it with seven felt markers, which are kind of like graffiti markers, on the wall. And here I'm uh, making a physical check-in on my physical studio wall instead of my Facebook one. So technically speaking, here, for example, I send an SMS message to the machine. Kadima Paul, that's what it said. It's nothing to brag about today. But uh, the information is transformed to uh, operations of these servo motors, which moves the mar markers up and down in a synchronized way to produce this text, like the font. And that's the felt marker dance. This is another early painting machine. It uses uh, acrylic paint to paint on a canvas that is hanged on the wall. You'll see it shortly. It has one a, a line of motion, one axis, and four pumps are pumping acrylic paint uh, on the canvas. And what it does is it takes information, in this case, from Google Trends and maps it into abstract paintings. So I created uh, searches of uh, a few search uh, terms each time. And the data I get from Google Trends is the statistics of uh, uh, searches a long time. So I get kind of like a mathematical graph of how many people searched a term along uh, the years. And here I represent each word by a different color. And what you see is actually a mathematical driven abstract painting. So it has all the information of, this, of these uh, searches, but in a way that also uh, gets randomness and the noise, physical noise inside. So I summon the noise by creating these physical conditions where the, fab, the, the, the material, the canvas, changes the, the specific motion of the paint on it, and the, each angle makes it a bit different. So I called it the originals factory, because even if I start from mathematical information, which is precise, I get eventually a unique pro, a product at the end. Another painting machine was done for a fresh paint art fair about uh, four or five years ago, uh, also with Asaf Talmudi. And uh, this was the opening event for the opening event of Fresh Paint. And here I built a painting machine which was uh, quite big. It's uh, three over four meter, hanged two meters above ground. And this time the canvas lies below it. And it also has acrylic paint that uh, is dropped on the canvas. And this time I used music as information. So the machine uh, analyzes sound in real time and maps the sound into a painting by uh, changing a few parameters of the sounds to the location and the amount of paint and which paint is dropped on the, uh, on the canvas. So you can see here Shlomi Shaban is playing the piano and notice how he's looking at the canvas while he's playing. So we had four concerts, 
each time had eventually a different result, both in the sound domain and in the visual domain. So it was a very playful event for us anyway. <laughs> so he was every time trying different things because he wanted to have different uh, or different expressions, both in the sound and in the vis vis visuals. to my first uh, solo exhibition that took place about two years ago, two and a half years ago, at Hansen House in Jerusalem, which is an amazing place that's worth going to any day. And I had four installations in this exhibition. I called the exhibition People You May Know, like the Facebook suggestion to meet new people, new friends. And it all dealt with the wish for intimacy and the wish to be heard in today's world, digital world, and it's about social networks in both meanings, in our uh, physical meaning and also in this uh, new way of thinking about it. Not that new anymore. And I ha this installation is a sound installation. It had 76 speakers hanged from the ceilings, each one in one of these uh, aluminum balls. And the sound is directed downwards and it moves from speaker to speaker. So it's actually kind of like a sound animation in the space. You have to walk with the sound in order to hear the text that is read there. And uh, the sound that you hear is me reading Facebook texts. I chose a kind of like, I try to find texts that have some intimacy in them and uh, have some personality in them. This is an, another installation that is synchronized with the sound installation. So it's kind of like an X, Y mechanism. You have these tubes on both walls. And whenever two tubes are pointing a, a single intersection, this is actually the location of the sound at the next room. So the two works are synchronized. The a route, the walking route, is generated in real time. It's a, a random walk process uh, that kind of simulates a human walk. So the two works, uh, one shows uh, these uh, identity leftovers and the other shows the leftovers of the physical location. The two works kind of work on air because sound rides on the air and here of course that, that is the obvious. And also I tried to have something between cold materials, metallic materials, and still to have some feeling of warmth and humanity. The third installation is a painting machine that paints with water on the plaster uh, surface. It's kind of like a construction, uh, ready-made plaster. And it writes the names of the people that I took the text from. So the water writes the names, and then a few minutes later, uh, it evaporates and disappears, just like the Facebook feed that we have in front of our, of our eyes. We can get excited by it, it can change some thoughts for us, but usually it immediately disappears. You can see that I don't hide the electronics or the technical parts. I think that's part of my action. And um, I don't try to make it more beautiful, let's say, or more aesthetics. It is what it is. The fourth installation had no electronics. That's the first time I show work with no electronics, actually. And it still has some uh, 
mathematic, mathematical thinking in it in a way. I can't es escape that. So it's built of 1,000 of these tubes. The tubes are made of mylar. It's kind of like a wrapping material that is used uh, for wet wipes for men, this particular one. I never saw the product it itself. I got this leftover of three kilometers of mylar from a wrapping factory. And these tubes are rolled in two ways. Sometimes the printed dark side is outside, and sometimes the silver side is outside. So it creates kind of like two pixels, two, two kinds of pixels. And it's hanged uh, at the patio of Hansen House, which is, it has uh, two floors with a balcony on the second floor. So it, you can be below or above the work. The work itself is hanged as the continuance of the floor of the second floor of the balcony. So you can walk around it or just walk below it. And below it, it gives a feeling of a, kind of like a small or a closed a, or intimate area. While above, it gives a more technical view or even a view of a field because the wind uh, moves these uh, tubes and makes uh, some sound, a bit of like metallic sound. And these tubes are created uh, to present an image. And the image is done by these 1,000 pixels. And it can, see, it can be seen only from a place where we can never actually get to, from above. You can see it a bit from the attic of the Hansen house. And what you would see if you get there is this. This is the plan, and that's the feminine, gen generic Facebook uh, profile image before you put your own image, your own personality. So it was a very obsessive uh, pr uh, process to create. I had uh, five people working with me for weeks uh, to make this project, and eventually it had only one mistake out of the 1,000 tubes. And the one mistake was, weirdly, the only thing that I uh, wanted, well, I couldn't decide of whether I should put or not put in the final uh, project, which was this pixel. So it kind of like, it was a schwanz in the hair. And I really wanted to have this small personal detail and I decided not to. And eventually that was the only mistake that we had. Yeah. And the work, of weeks can be destroyed in five minutes. That's the way it ended. I tried to bring all my zen to this moment. <laughs> no attachment. Actually, I, some of the emotion I have for this work is because of this moment of no attachment. A month and a half. And it survived the Jerusalem winter with some snow as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a few months later, the same uh, work that I had in the, uh, the sound installation moved to the Israel Museum uh, to an exhibition uh, called um, huh? Help me, Kitzur Toldot Ha'enoshut. And then it moved later to Bonn uh, Budenskunsthalle. And now it's packed in uh, Lod. <laughs> this is another work uh, that uh, puts focus on ephemerality, as, like many of my other works too. And here I use a material this, that is sensitive to UV light. And when I expose it, it changes the color uh, of the surface to blue. And then it fades back after about 30 or 40 seconds. So the machine itself has this uh, rail with well, all the mechanics and the, uh, all the electronics and the software lies here basically. And it has an array of UV LED that when they flicker, they change the color of the surface temporarily. 
And I created uh, this machine, uh, which I called the attending machine. And I created a Facebook event where I called people to donate their virtual identity to art. And whoever said they're attending the event got inside the machine. So there are around 250 people where, uh, that I took their profile images and put them inside the machine. And whenever I have this machine working, it still have, well, the event is only there. So the event, on one hand, never existed, but on the other hand, it will exist as long as I show it. And it's going to be showed next week, actually, at uh, an exhibition in the Benjamin Gallery. Welcome to come. Shameless promotion. <laughs> this is my last uh, solo exhibition that was uh, happening in Berlin a few months ago. And I called it, This is not a typewriter. And here I created a, a painting machine, another painting machine, that takes text and maps the text into visuals, abstract vis visuals that also contain all the information of the text. It looks like that. And I had uh, three sets of rules that map the, the sequence of the characters into motions of the machine. So the simplest one is this, which creates kind of like a linear uh, visual. So here each letter uh, has an, which has a numerical value basically, uh, is mapped into length of a line or length of a space. So the information also exists in the spaces here. But theoretically, this is linear, so you can decode it. If you know the, if you have the key, you can, <laughs> you can uh, understand the text. But the other mappings, they makes more, they mark more like a statistics over the text. So here, for example, the machine moves either on the x-axis or on the y-axis, uh, alternatively. And the text uh, create these kind of like uh, cubic uh, visuals that are summed one on top of the other. So it gives you more a visual of the language rather than of the text itself. That's the way. Uh, like. And to some, I want to tell you a bit about the process I'm doing now. And uh, this will get me back uh, to the theme, the theme of, the, uh, of today's talk, information equality. So I'm starting to work on a, on a project that is going to be, uh, it's going to use data from a, a dating apps, basically. So the dating app that I'm looking at starts with the letter T and rhymes with winter. <laughs> and the, the reason I say this way, because we're recorded after all, and I just heard that uh, winter is coming <laughs> after people that uh, use their, their data. And <laughs> so well, I'm not going to tell you about the project itself. It's very pre preliminary now. But what I realized when I started working on it is that this illusion of privacy is so big that it even surprised me that I, I, I think that I'm really in this world of, uh, of data. And I realized that like, very quickly, I managed to download profile winter profiles of uh, all my Facebook friends. So after saying that, I hope you'll still be my Facebook friends. Uh, all, the face all my Facebook friends who have winter <laughs> accounts, <laughs> uh, well, now I have them locally on my computer. And not, not only that, for example, it's like the, the app gives you a distance to every user that you want. So by virtually changing my GPS coordinates and triangulating uh, these uh, distances from three places, I can actually realize, I can calculate the, the location of any user, which is quite amazing. It shouldn't be, but it is. So this is the other side of uh, equality of information. It's all out there. I think I'm not judgmental about it. I think it has good and bad, but it is what it is. 
So thank you for coming. <laughs>